In this video, we now focus on the other half of the adaptive immune response, T lymphocytes, which I will call T cells most of the time. These cells have two major roles. First, some of them regulate the immune system. The other half manage host cells that have become infected. All of them respond to antigens using a T cell receptor. It is similar in structure to antibodies in that it has a variable region in a constant region. There are two protein fragments, an alpha chain and a beta chain. However, unlike antibody receptors, they will respond to antigen only when associated with another host cell. This antigen presenting cell will place the antigen in a major histocompatibility complex, which I'll call MHC, and present it to the T cell. Almost all human cells have MHC molecules. There are two types. MHC1 are found on almost all cells and are status monitors for the cell. MHC2 molecules are found only on antigen presenting cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells for the most part. At the right is a cartoon and a space filling model of an MHC molecule. The purple peptide is the antigen that you can see is tucked in a groove of the MHC molecule. The TCR interacts with that groove and it fits with the antigen. The TCR interacts with the groove and if it fits with the antigen, the T cell activates. So how do proteins get in that groove? Well, it differs depending upon whether it's an MHC1 molecule or MHC2 molecule. In MHC1 molecules, they bind peptides that originate inside the cell. Constantly inside the cytoplasm, a portion of peptides are digested by the host machinery. Some of these fragments end up on MHC1 molecules. If an intracellular parasite, such as a virus, is infecting the cell, some of the MHC1 molecules will inevitably pick up and display viral proteins on the surface of the cell. The immune system reacts to this, namely T cells. This process is a way of signaling the health of the cell. MHC2 molecules are present on cells of the immune system. These APCs serve as vessels to present foreign antigens to T cells. MHC2 molecules bind to antigens that originate from an exogenous source such as the leftovers of a phagolysosome or antigens picked up by dendritic cells. These are then processed and put into an MHC2 molecule and then presented to a T cell. All of these antigens and MHC molecules are presented to T cells. So let's go through the different types. There are several different types of T cells, but in this case, we are going to talk about two broad categories, CD4 plus and CD8 plus T cells. CD4 plus cells regulate the immune system. Three important groups are Th1 cells that recruit and regulate cells involved in cell mediated immunity, CMI, Th2 cells that regulate B cell ant cells and antibody production, and T suppressor cells that help turn down the immune response after it has dealt with a pathogen. The other group are CD8 plus cells, and these are cytotoxic T cells. They are activated when their TCR matches an antigen presented to them in an MHC1 molecule. They then attack the cell that activated them. You can think of them as sentries that patrol the body looking for infected cells. Note, these are the major types. In immunology, they've been split into even more subgroups, but we're not gonna cover that in this class. All right, just to summarize, here are examples of the interactions of CD8 plus and CD4 plus cells with whole cells. Note how they are so named by the co-receptor CD8 or CD4, right? And you can see, you know, internal foreign proteins are processed in, in the CD8 and presented to a T cytotoxic T cell. And in an antigen printing cell, presenting cell, they're getting this protein 
from somewhere else, this external pro protein that's put on there and then presented. We now turn to the topic of how B cells and T cells mature and how they are trained to not only attack self antigens, because remember what they are mostly responding to is macromolecules, most often pieces of protein. How do they know if a protein is part of the host or not? And how do they respond to so many antigens? We talked about this a little bit before when we talked about discerning self from non-self, but now we're getting into the details and it's actually pretty fascinating. Common lymphoid progenitor cells enter into either the bone marrow, B cells, or the thymus, T cells for maturation. As they are created, they are programmed for cell death. Unless during selection, the tissues intervene, they will perish. They then go through a series of steps. First, they are tested to make sure the signaling system works and the receptor is functional. If anything is amiss here, the cells are allowed to die. Then they are tested to see if they bind to self antigens or if they react too strongly to any antigen. Again, being allowed to perish if they fail these tests. If they pass these tests, they are programmed to live. B cells aren't called in exactly the same way, but they only activate well when the help from T cells and T suppressors control inappropriate responses. So they also are controlled. There are even more tolerance mechanisms. Some of them are shown here. In clonal energy, a cytotoxic C cell may react to a self antigen when presented in an MAC1 molecule, but its partner, the Th1 cell, will not react to that same self antigen, and thus the cytotoxic T cell is never activated. T suppressor cells also cut off the normal immune response when it's no longer needed. If you have self, if also if you have a self-reacted Th cell, then you have a companion T suppressor cell. The companion T suppressor cell will shut down an apparent response immediately instead of waiting because because of the reaction to the cell, it will realize that this is a self antigen. Finally, T cells will sp suppress self reactions by sequestering certain tissues. For example, the cornea has no blood vessels and this is not accessible to the immune system and you can't get in aberrant responses there. So now let's dig into more about the structure of T cell receptors and antibodies and how their diversity is created. First, there are similarities between T cells and immunoglobulins. Both have variable regions and conserved regions. The variable domains, V, recognize the antigen. The conserved domains, C, interface with the rest of the immune system. Also, these domains are linked by dull disulfide bonds, so they share a lot of similarities in structure. But there are also differences between T-cell receptors and antibodies. T-cell receptors have two different polypeptide chains instead of a light and heavy chain. Second, T-cell receptors have only one antigen binding site. Third, T-cell receptors are not secreted in contrast to antibodies. Since they are similar in structure, you won't be surprised that the creation of their diversity during development follows a similar pathway. But how does that work? Let's have you take a guess at first by answering this question. You're going to be challenged by thousands of pathogens in your lifetime with numerous an antigens to recognize. How can your immune system make variable regions to code for all of them? Remember, that your genome codes for about 30,000 genes total. Okay, let's look at the answer. So how do T cell receptors and antibodies generate all this diversity? It turns out that the genes that encode T cell receptors and antibodies are not contiguous units 
and there are clusters of gene fragments that combine. During maturation of the T or B cell, after it's you know, created in the bone marrow and then it goes through a maturation process, the receptor gene is selectively spliced together. For example, for the heavy chain of an antibody, one of 65 V regions, one of 27 D regions, and one of six J regions are spliced together with the constant region. The, which one is picked is random. And this alternative recombination leads to millions of possibilities. This is important enough that we are gonna go through the math. For an antibody, the light chain can have 30 or 40 V regions and four or five J regions, dep depending on whether the kappa or lambda light chain is picked. For a heavy chain, there are 65, 27, and six combinations as described previously. This leads to 320 light chain combinations and 10,530 heavy chain combinations. Any light chain variable region can combine with any heavy chain, leading to 3,386,600 combinations. The variation is actually even higher than that. The V region has a high rate of mutation during development, so it can change amino acids within each it as it's developed. Also, the joining between regions is not exact. They can slide up to 30 base pairs. So there are actually hundreds of millions of possible combinations. The same is true for T cells. Here is shown the map of the TCR genes on chromosomes 7 and 14. You have numerous V, J, and D regions that can combine to remake unique structures. All of these will splice together in a fashion similar to what happens in antibodies. Again, the math is similar and you can generate a huge number of variations. What this means is that the shape of the variable regions on T cell receptors and antibodies is nearly infinite. No matter how a pathogen mutates or changes the shape of its macromolecules, there will be a T cell receptor and antibody that can recognize it and react to it. Amazing. Okay, this is really important. So I want you to sit down for a minute and summarize what we just talked about. It's this core of how your immune, adaptive immune system recognizes self from non-self. So stop the video right now and go through and write down a summary of how this works. Okay, here is my answer. See how close yours is to this. Antibody and T cell receptor diversity is created by random splicing of VJ and D fragments as the lymphocyte matures. These are, these are then tested in the bone marrow, B cells, or in the thymus, T cells. When they are created, they are programmed to go through apoptosis or die. B and T cells are tested in two, two ways. First, the receptor is tested to make sure it functions normally. Then the receptor is tested to see if it reacts to self-antigens. If it fails on either of these tests, it is eliminated. If it passes, it then migrates to tissues in the body. Okay, that's how diversity is created and how T and B cells mature. Let's go now and talk specifically more about how T cells are activated and then what happens to them. T cell activation happens when an antigen presenting cell presents an antigen to a T cell receptor and the complex fits together. A second signal is also necessary where B72 on the APC interacts with the CD28 receptor. The second signal is part of the regulation of the T cell and allows modulation of the strength of the T cell response. The successful interaction of a T cell with an antigen presenting cell will start a regulator cascade in the T cell that activates its response. The nature of this response is dependent on the type of T cell. Th1 and Th2 cells will explain clonally and then fill their roles in re regulating cytotoxic T cells for Th1 or the antibodies response for Th2. Cytotoxic T cells have a different response. When activated, 
cytotoxic T cells turn on and kill the cells that activated them. The cytotoxic T cell kills in two ways. First, TC cells secrete FAS and tumor necrosis factor, TNF, ligands on the surface that bind to FAS and TNF receptors on the surface of the target cell. This precipitates a signaling pathway that leads to apoptosis. In other words, the T cell says, hey, cell that I reacted with, you got a problem, you need to program yourself to die. Second, fully differentiated T cytotoxic T cells have granules inside them that contain perforin and granzymes. The TC cell makes contact with the target cell and then releases the perforin. This polymerizes and forms pores in the target cell membrane. The granzymes then release from the T cell and migrate through the porphyrin pores into the target cell. When the granzymes, such as serine protease, activate nucleases and cap spaces in the target cell, further encouraging apoptosis and eventually the cell dies. So, <clears throat> a quick concept check. What is, the, what is true about TC cell interactions with the MHC? To summarize T cells, they have different functions. T cells were just explained in the previous slide. T helper cells come in a number of, variety of varieties and we'll talk, we talked about Th1, the direct cell mediated immunity, and Th2, the direct antibody production. There are a lot more details about the immune system we didn't cover. If you're interested, there are whole courses on immunology. Okay, we're now going to put it all together. Go read section 16.5 of the textbook and get an idea of the action of the entire process. But I definitely encourage you to go through and read that section. Okay. That was a long discussion, but it gives you an idea of how this whole immune system works together. Now, let's have, now that we've gone through the process, let's see if you can arrange these steps in infection. So take the body defense mini map, arrange the different steps, number them. I'll give you a minute to do that, stop the video, and on the next slide, I'll show you the answer. Okay, here is the answer. Now read part of section 16.5 that describes a viral infection. Note that a very similar response would happen in COVID-19. So the big difference here is cell mediated immunity is much more important in fighting viral infections. Your immune response is amazingly powerful and can defend you against pathogens that haven't even existed. The COVID-19 epidemic was a prime example of this. While too many people died from this infection, realized that at least 98% of individuals did not. And this is a virus that we are completely immunologically naive to, yet most of us were able to defend ourselves against it. The immune response is multiphasic with the innate response first defending against the pathogen. When the innate response fails, then the adaptive response is called into action. Once you have been exposed to a pathogen and survive, in most cases, your, prote your protective immunity will protect you against the pathogen for a very long time. Okay, that is the end of the lectures on immunology.